Hello and welcome back to Congressional Dish, the weekly podcast that tells you the good, the bad, and the really ugly contents of the bills passed by Congress. This was election week, so Congress is not back in session yet. They come back November 13th, but this is a bonus episode. I'm giving a little bit of background on what I'm looking for while I'm reading these bills. Um, I feel like this is needed, especially after watching this $6 billion election in which absolutely nothing changed. Barack Obama stays the president, the Republicans are keeping the House, the Democrats are keeping the Senate, and all that money went basically down the drain. After watching this, and especially seeing the, the fights and just the anger between people that identify as Republicans and ad- identify as Democrats, I feel like there's a need to explain how I see things because I clearly don't see things as a struggle between those two parties, between Democrat and Republican, left and right, red and blue. Those that just, for me, those are not the two sides. So I want to explain to you how I see things. Um, after my, my years of obsessing about what is going wrong in this country, because it seems like we all feel that there's something wrong here. We all seem to know that we're working hard, but it's getting harder to pay the bills and things seem to be getting more expensive. It's not like it was in the 50s where the man can go to work and the woman can stay home. That's not possible anymore. Now you need two people working. Um, we're, We're all feeling like we pay enough in taxes. Everybody does. No one thinks that we should have to pay more, but where is the money going? Why are there potholes in the streets and why are there bridges falling down? And why does it feel like neither of these parties represent our interests? Why was it that there were so many people that voted for Barack Obama, not because they like him anymore, but because they were afraid of Romney? Why are we picking the lesser of two evils year after year after year? And I think I know why that is. And so I want to give you guys some context so that going forward, we can be on the same page and that I can reference this anytime someone new comes into our little congressional dish community here. So so I guess I'm going to start with defining the two sides. If I don't think that it's Democrat, Republican, red, blue, left, right, then what do I think it is? And I believe that the two sides in this country are the corporatists and the rest of us. And I'm aware that that's a word that isn't used very often and you might not know what it is. Um, For me, corporatism is defined by being someone who thinks that the benefit of big business is all that matters and that government exists only for defense, only for military purposes and nothing else. Now, this ideology is hard to spot because it has a lot of different names and, um, For instance, the grandfather of this whole ideology is an economist from the 1950s named Milton Friedman, and he called himself a liberal, but his followers here in the United States, they're conservatives, they call themselves classical economists, free marketers, we call them neoconservatives, the people that are hardcore about this, the fundamentalists, they're neoconservatives. In the rest of the world, they're known as neoliberals. And their economic system is known as either Reaganomics or laissez-faire. A lot of times you will hear the word globalization. All of these words, all of these terms generally mean the same thing. And that thing is what I'm going to try to help you see in this podcast. Now, Milton Friedman was a professor at the University of Chicago in the 1950s. And that's when all of this started. So... Back then, because of the shape-shifting nature of what this is called, even though laissez-faire had been tried in the past, that's not a term that Milton Friedman used to decide to describe his theories, and so it wasn't recognized, so people didn't know what was happening to them. We are in a position today that we can know what's happening to us because there's been example after example after example for the past 60 years, and this isn't stuff that the corporate media is going to cover because they are directly benefiting from it. So I'm going to tell you some history that you probably haven't learned in school. Um, Now, first, I want to tell you guys the basics of the neoconservative agenda because 
essentially they are fundamentalists about the economy the way that evangelicals are fundamentalists about their religion. And so you need to know what those fundamentals are because for them, a free market is a perfect scientific system. It's as the rules are as steadfast and basic as nature itself. So, and the, that basic rule is that the market, if you leave it alone, if it has no regulations and no rules, will regulate itself to be a perfect system for everybody. And so if that's the basics, it comes to pass that if there's anything wrong in, a, in an economy, if there's something wrong for a group of people, let's say that there's unemployment or if there's high inflation or massive poverty, that must be because the market isn't free enough, because a truly free market is perfection. So that's their solution to everything. We have to get back to the fundamentals. We have to make the market more free. And so what are the rules? How do you make the market more free? The first rule is that governments need to remove all rules and regulations standing in the way of the accumulation of profits. Now, getting rid of regulations, this is a theme I hear over and over and over again, all day, every day. Sorry, just got a tweet. Um, and so here's a little montage I've put together. This is of three people that we just reelected back to the House. This is Marsha Blackburn of Tennessee, Kevin Brady of Texas, and Jack Kingston of Georgia. Less regulation plus less taxation plus less litigation always equals more innovation and more job creation right here in this country. We need to free our small businesses from the oppressive level of regulation coming out of Washington. We need to roll back job-killing regulations. You don't have to work, out, work for worker safety at the expense of the job. There is a balance. Government agencies need to work with the entrepreneur and the employer and the job creator, not against him or her. See that? So the role of government is not to police business, but instead to work with them. Um, so that's the first one. They shouldn't have any rules or regulations that stand in their way. The second, the government should sell off any assets that they own or operate that the corporations could be running for a profit. And they're pretty passionate about this one. This next clip is Mike Kelly of Pennsylvania. In this particular clip, he's talking about selling off um, government buildings. I come from the private sector, where sometimes assets become liabilities. And an asset becomes a liability when it costs you so much to insure it, secure it, and maintain it that it no longer serves the purpose it was originally designed for. Wouldn't it just make sense to take them from the liability side and put it on an asset side? It no longer will cost the American taxpayers money to secure, insure, and maintain. It would go into the private sector would create jobs, and these people would convert these into a use that makes more sense for today. They would start paying taxes on it. This is a win-win situation for the American taxpayer. And that's not the only thing that I've heard them advocate the selling of. I've actually seen them trying to sell land to an, um, a foreign mining company in, I believe it was New Mexico, a couple years ago. And more recently this year, they keep trying to give away federal land to um, oil and coal companies. So this happens more than I'd like to admit. So number one and number two is that there should be no rules and regulations in the way of profits and that they should sell, the government should sell any assets it owns that corporations could be running for a profit. In fact, this clip just amazes me. This is Steve King of Iowa arguing that keeping and holding on to these things is a form of sort of stealing from the private sector. Well, I've heard jobs, jobs, jobs for a long time. It's nice that we're about jobs. I haven't heard a lot about profit, 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 which is required to pay for the payroll to create jobs, jobs, jobs. And this profit isn't something that comes from a government job. Government jobs consume the profits of the private sector. The endeavor of the president's economic plan should be to roll people out of public employment and into the private sector because the private sector is producing goods and services with a marketable value both here and abroad. So a job doesn't really count unless it's servicing the market. If it's servicing the public, as the government is tasked to do, then that isn't 
the right order of things, according to this, this theory. Um, and then the third one is that the government should dramatically cut back the funding of social programs. I don't think you need me to make clips to prove this one to you because all you have to do is turn on the TV or open a newspaper and you can see the conservatives arguing that we need to cut, 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 cut spending. And this is what they're talking about. They need to cut Medicare and Social Security and definitely food stamps. They try and cut and they successfully do cut uh, food stamps all the time. Um, but what happens to the people that knew, need those food stamps? Well, according to their theory, the market just didn't like what they were selling, and so it doesn't really matter what happens to them. This is Rob Woodall of Georgia. The American government is supposed to be about protecting the freedom of the American people, and that includes, Mr. Speaker, freedom to fail. Freedom to fail. You get to make the choices you want to make about your life but you also have to bear the consequences. If you want to take great risks, if you have great success, you benefit from that. And if you have great failure, you pay the price for that. We cannot insulate people, Mr. Speaker. Freedom to fail. Sounds very George Bushy, doesn't it? Um, anyway, so recapping. The first part of their agenda is that governments should remove all rules and regulations that prevent the accumulation of profits. They should sell off any of their assets that corporations could be running for a profit, and they should dramatically cut back social spending um, programs. Some specifics that they also are that are also part of the fundamentals is that taxes, when they should exist, should be as low as possible, and the rich and the poor should be taxed at the exact same rate. Um, also, corporations should be free to sell their products anywhere in the world with no restrictions, and governments should never make an effort to protect their local industries. And last, all prices, including the price of our labor, so how much you get paid, should be determined by the market, and there should be no minimum wage. So if your boss wants to pay you 10 cents an hour, he should be able to do that because, well, freedom for the market, not freedom for you. Now, the first country that got to experiment with Milton Friedman's free market ideas was the South American country of Chile. His plan, uh, Milton Friedman's, while he was in the University of Chicago, was to get a group of Chilean students to come and learn from him at the University of Chicago. The Ford Foundation, as in Ford Motors, paid for these Chilean students to come and study with the professor himself. Um, then these same students went back to Chile. They were nicknamed the Chicago Boys, and they went to teach at Catholic University. Now, on the national scale, the country in 1952 had just had an election, and every single person who was running in that election for the presidency was running on a nationalist platform, saying that we're going to protect our industries and we're going to keep them in the state's hand, which is the exact opposite of free market principles. So the only way that this country was going to start in the experiment with the free market was to kick out the government. And so in 1953, the CIA, which we pay for, um, staged a coup and kicked out the president who had won in the Democratic election and installed Augusto Pinochet. And now with Pinochet heading the country, they were able to go ahead and enforce these economic policies um, onto the people. So they had these Chicago boys come and create something called the BRIC, which was their master plan. It was their free market plan. And then putting it into action, they privatized some of their banks. They opened the borders to foreign imports, which wasn't allowed before. They cut government spending across the board by 10% while increasing the military's pay. And they eliminated all their price controls, sending prices skyrocketing. Now, the people didn't like these things, and so when they started to protest, that's when Pinochet cracked down and earned his reputation as a brutal torturer and murderer, um, having tortured thousands and thousands of people. Um, and that's how they kept the people under control. So, um, And that wasn't the only time that he that he enforced these policies. In 1975, they cut spending by another 27%, and by 1980, the spending had been cut in half. Um, their public schools were turned into private charter schools, and people were given vouchers instead of getting their education paid for through their taxes. Their healthcare system became pay-as-you-go, which should sound familiar to those of us in the States who have to fork over a bunch of cash every time we get the sniffles. And Social Security was... Um, fully privatized, 
which is definitely a goal here in the States. This is Rob Woodall once again. The money is in Medicare and Medicaid. The money is in Social Security. Mr. Speaker, I'm in my 40s. We must, we must come to people in my age bracket and say no more. You will not get what your parents got. Got to say that to me. And how did all this turn out for the people of Chile? Well, aside from getting tortured and murdered, hundreds of thousands of them lost their jobs. Unemployment went from 3% to 20%, um, which wasn't good for the regular people. But the financiers, which were known in the country as the Paranas, um, they made a killing on speculation. And all of the companies that were able to take advantage of the open borders also profited heavily from from the experiment in Chile. Now, in 1982, after their spending had been cut in half, the economy crashed, their debt exploded, and that 20% unemployment rate went up to 30%. So Chile didn't turn out so good. Indonesia has a eerily similar story to Chile. In um, 1965, they had um, a president who was also running on nationalist platforms promising to protect industry. So in 1965, the CIA threw out their democratically elected leader and installed General Suharto. Now, when Suharto took power, the CIA gave him a list of people that they considered to be dirty pinko leftists, and those people were systematically eliminated from the country. This was done with weapons that were provided to the general by the Pentagon. It was also, they also gave them radio so that the people could communicate with each other. And once all the names were crossed off, that's how the left was silenced with this particular adventure. Um, in this particular country, when General Suharto took power, because he didn't know anything about economics, it was the Berkeley Mafia that was put in charge of the economy. The Berkeley Mafia was a group of students that were sent to the University of California, Berkeley, to study free market economics, and that project was also funded by the Ford Foundation. So, And I just want you to take note, this is now 12 years later, after the coup that took place in Chile, and this economic thing has now spread throughout the Ivy League. It started in the University of Chicago, but now these students are going to Berkeley. So, so it's spreading in the United States at the same time that it's spreading in the, the South American continent. So after the Berkeley Mafia takes over the economy, they started implementing the plan. They removed regulations on foreign ownership. They sold their nickel wealth. Um, they had a lot of nickel, a lot of copper, a lot of oil, and they sold the rights to those to the biggest energy and mining multinationals in the world. So big success for them. And in a second later round is when they sold off more of their assets. So Nissan bought one of their largest car companies. Um, their water system was split between a British and a French company. Their power plant was bought by a Canadian energy company. And Suharto was able to rule that country with an iron fist for 30 years. He's another one that resorted to torturing and murdering. And the result for the people in this country, much like in Chile, was their unemployment skyrocketed. It tripled and has never recovered. Argentina's story starts out a lot like Chile and Indonesia's stories did. In 1976, their government was overthrown in a coup. Um, in this particular case, the top economic job went to a man named Martinez de Hoz. Now, he was not one of these students, but he was a disciple of Milton Friedman's ideas. And they worked out really well for him because he was a member of the cattle aristocracy. And they liked their old feudal system just fine, where they could run their very, very profitable businesses using very cheap labor. And um, he was also the, on the board of several multinational corporations. So he came into office using these, these principles and banned strikes. He allowed employees to be fired at the will of their bosses. He removed regulations on foreign ownership of Argentinian assets, and he sold hundreds of their state companies to, to multinationals around the world. And how did this work out for the people? Well, their factories closed because their jobs went overseas. Sounds familiar. Their wages lost 40% of their value. That is a huge pay cut. And as a result, poverty skyrocketed. 
And in a very, very good turn of events for Martinez de Hos, the meat prices rose 700%. So the people that actually had to eat, that was a problem because it got a lot more expensive. But for people that profit off of a price increase like that, it was an amazing time for them. So um, that government only survived six years. The dictatorship um, actually collapsed in 1982. But before it collapsed, the dictatorship gave the corporations a parting gift. They announced that the state, that Argentina and Argentinian taxpayers, would absorb the debts that the co companies that had come in and gobbled up their assets had racked up in those purchases. So that was, it was about 15 to $20 billion, and it went to such companies as Ford, uh, Chase Manhattan, Citibank, IBM, and Mercedes-Benz. So... Essentially, what happened is that these companies were allowed to keep the assets, they were able to keep their profits, but the Argentinian taxpayers would have to pay the debts that they racked up, taking their wealth out of the country. So, yeah, that happened. And then this is where the Argentinian story varies from Chile and Indonesia. In 1992, they also had a second round, but this one happened different, differently. Carlos Menem won the election, but he won it running as a nationalist. Now, usually the people that ran as nationalists, these were the people that got overthrown in coups, but this particular guy, he ran as a nationalist, but when he came into office, he put the man who, had, who was in charge of those bailouts of Ford and Chase and Citibank, he put the bailout guy in charge of the economy. So what did bailout guy do? He cut spending. He started a new currency that's, that was attached to the U.S. dollar, which, little side note, they're now reversing in Argentina. Um, they fired 700,000 workers to make companies more attractive for buyers. And the reason is if, if the workers are not in the companies when you purchase the company, then you can hire people at dramatically less um, and give them less wages and benefits than you could if they were existing employees. Um, this guy also sold the oil fields, the phone system, the airline, their trains, the airport, the highways, the water system, the banks, the zoo, the post office, and their pension system. And how did this work out for the people? Well, their wealth, obviously, from all of those different things, went offshore. Inflation did go down, which was part of the goal. Um, but then Argentinian businesses couldn't compete with the, the multinationals, and half the country fell below the poverty level. So some people got rich, fabulously rich, rich, and a lot of people got poor. The disposable people, the people that didn't work in this system, they were extra people. Now what's fascinating about this is that the, the economic plan that was put forth in this second round by the bailout guy that plan was actually written by J.P. Morgan and, and Citibank. And in 2001, December of 2001, the president and his finance minister, this economic um, bailout guy, were both run out of the country. So that is how it worked out in Argentina. Now, I would be doing us a disservice if I didn't put China in this podcast because China, every time you hear about it, at least on places like Fox News, they call it communist China. Communist China, communist China, making you think that the reason that the Chinese are poor and making our iPhones for pennies is because they're communists. And that's not the case and hasn't been the case for quite a long time because in 1980, their government wanted in to this capitalist economy, but they wanted to keep the authoritarian rule, which, as we know now from the Chile and Indonesia experiences, those two totally go together. That wasn't a problem. So in 1980, the China, the People's Republic of China invited Milton Friedman himself to go to China and teach the high-level employees the fundamentals of the free, mar free market theory. And in this particular country, the crackdown came right away. Now, the reason that they needed the crackdown is when the government was telling the people what their plans were. They recognized pretty quickly that the reforms were code for the party officials that were planning to buy the public assets and become business tycoons, which is exactly what happened. And in um, 1989, after the people had started to protest, the People's Republic of China declared martial law. 
And on June 3, or <laughs> on June 3rd of 1989, tanks rolled into their cities. The soldiers randomly fired into the crowds, killed a bunch of people. And you know that famous picture in Tiananmen Square of the guy standing in front of the tanks. That is how this went down. And um, the government saved some extra violence for the factory workers because it was the factory workers. It was the people that were going to see their wages go down and their labor devalued that were the biggest threat to this capitalist transformation. So after that crackdown, the people of China were absolutely terrified of their government. And in the three years following the Tiananmen Square massacre, China opened its economy to foreign investment. They offer super low taxes and tariffs, and their terrified workforce will work next to nothing. And that's how they became the sweatshop of the world. That's why they're making all of our products, our clothes and our dishes and our iPhones. That's how that happened. Their labor was devalued, not because of their communist system, but because of their capitalist system. Um, and now I'm not saying that communism was great for these people, but capitalism hasn't been great for them either. So... Um, now, by 1985, this Milton Friedman free market economic theory had become all the rage in all the countries throughout the world. So this is, we're in a different time now. We're in a different era. It's not 1950 anymore, where this is just the brainchild of an economist from the University of Chicago. This had swept throughout the world. In fact, Milton Friedman won the Nobel Prize in economics. I don't know what year, but <clears throat> his theory became the model for every country that was in trouble. Um, it was the preferred way of doing things. And so in Bolivia in the 1980s, they had a president who had just been elected as a nationalist. So he ran saying he was going to protect their industry. But as soon as he came into office, taking a cue from the second round in Argentina, he pulled a bait and switch. He just straight up lied and um, had a secret team of economists draft a free market economic plan for the country. Their free market plan, eliminated their food subsidies, so their equivalent of food stamps. It canceled almost all their price controls, so kind of like how rent control used to be a thing. Um, they took all of that away. Um, they had a 300% hike in the price of oil. They had big cuts in government spending. They deregulated foreign imports. They had layoffs at state companies, and the government froze... Um, froze the wages of government employees. And I do think that it's important to know that our own federal employees haven't seen any increase in their pay for three years now. Um, the Democrats, when they had control of Congress, had a pay freeze, and then the Republicans put in another one last year. So this is happening here, too. And so when this package came out from this back room, the author of the authors said, OK, you want to do something about hyperinflation? You have to accept this whole package or reject the whole thing. You can't amend it at all. And so it was accepted. And after they put these um, policies into practice, inflation did go down. It did. It went down to 10%. However, unemployment went from 20% to 30%. The minimum wage was lowered and has never recovered. And their wages went down 40%. In fact, at one point, their wages were down 70%. I can't even imagine. And at the same time that people had lost their 70%, 70% of their paychecks just disappeared. At the same time, the elite in, in Bolivia got much, much wealthier. And so it's just a small group of people. It's the owners of these companies that are getting fabulously wealthy through profits and through their actions in the stock exchange. But it is not the majority of the people. Um, so this small group gets much wealthier. And labor, in response to this unfairness, called for a general strike that brought industry to a total halt. So, and so even though Bolivia's experiment started out in a relatively peaceful way, um, the president, you know, lied, said he was a nationalist, became a free marketer. But eventually, this also had to have a crackdown. So it's kind of chilly in Indonesia, but in a different order. The crackdown came a little bit later, and um, tanks went into the streets. There was a strict curfew put in place. You needed special passes to travel throughout Bolivia, even if you were Bolivian. Um, the police raided union halls, a university, a radio station. They prohibited all political assemblies and marches and meetings. You could only have meetings for anything with permission from the state. So... 
um, didn't turn out so well in Bolivia, and that was only round one. They did have a second round in the mid-90s where um, the national oil company, their airline, their railway, their electricity and phone companies, those were all sold to foreign companies. Some of those companies that benefited from that were Enron and Royal Dutch Shell, Citicorp, and none of these companies were required to partner with the locals. So they could do whatever they wanted with the um, with the money that came out of out of Bolivia. And in the end of all this, the president had to flee the country. Um, and he was obviously thrown out of office. Where did he flee to? The United States, where he's been living, as far as I know, peacefully ever since. Um, but before he fleed, 70 protesters had to die. So... That's Bolivia. So I think you guys might be catching on to the pattern now. Um, these policies don't work out for the majority. They just don't. And so in every single one of these countries, there's some kind of violent crackdown on the people when they decide to stand up and say this isn't fair. So they get squeezed and squeezed and squeezed until their breaking point. And as soon as they do something about it, kind of like we did during Occupy, as soon as they do something about it, you see students getting pepper sprayed in the face. Now, this next story, I think, is a good illustration of where our own country stands when it comes to these policies. This next story is going to be about Russia. And this one, this one is a fascinating story in and of itself. I think it would make an amazing movie. Um, and what I find so fascinating about it is that I never knew about this version, even though I was old enough to be aware of what was happening. Um, this was in the 1990s, and I was a teenager, and I didn't know the story, the way it really went down. So I'm going to tell you that right now. Now, in the 1990s, the late 80s, 90s, um, Russia was coming out of its communist era. So in a communist area, the state owns everything. And so there was this pot of gold just sitting there that the multinational corporations and the bankers were just drooling over because they had huge oil fields. Um, Russia has 30% of the world's natural gas reserves. It has 20% of the world's nickel. It has weapons factories. It has a state media apparatus. And they wanted to get their hands on it. So when communism fell in Russia, um, Mikhail Gorbachev was told, okay, it's time to embrace the free market, buddy. Um, he was told that in 1991 at the G7 meeting. At the same time as that G7 meeting happened, Boris Yeltsin was the president of Russia. So you have the Soviet Union, which is a collection of countries. That's run by Gorbachev. Then you have Yeltsin, who's in charge of just Russia itself. So he had a lower profile than Gorbachev did. But that changed in August of 1991. A group of communist old guards drove tanks up to the Russian parliament building, the, the site of their new democracy, and threatened to attack it. And Yeltsin literally stood on one of the tanks and denounced the aggression as a cynical right-wing coup attempt, and the tanks retreated. So this made Boris Yeltsin a defender of democracy who's basically democracy's hero. He was loved in that country. And so um, in December of 1991, four months later, Yeltsin did something that was completely br brilliant, which is that he formed an alliance as Russia's president with some other Soviet republics, and that new alliance helped dissolve the Soviet Union, which forced Gorbachev to resign, because if there is no Soviet Union, he can't be the president of anything. So now, Boris Yeltsin is the president of Russia, and he can do whatever he wants with it. So he enlists a man named Jeffrey Sachs, and the reason that I bring up Jeffrey Sachs is that he was a Harvard-trained economist who had helped with the transformation of Bolivia. And the reason that I bring him up is that I just want to make it clear that this started in the University of Chicago. But we've already noticed that now people are being trained in this at Berkeley. And now we have Harvard involved. So when you look around you now, and there's people, especially of bo baby boomer age, that have adopted these policies and think that this is true, that the free market, when left alone, will do the best thing for everybody. These were ideas that were being told as truth, as unquestioned truth, at the top schools in the country. And that did trickle down. This is the one thing about this economic theory that did trickle down, is that this came down to the, the lower level colleges as well. So these people, like, our parents went to school and they learned that this stuff was true. And so that's why they believe it so strongly. So just keep that in mind. This Harvard guy um, comes and works with Yeltsin. 
And in late 1991, so this is like five minutes after the Soviet Union had dissolved, he went to parliament and said, okay, I know that our economy is in trouble. If you give me one year of special dictatorial powers and let me make laws by decree instead of bringing them to you for a vote, I can solve the economic crisis and give you back a thriving, healthy system. And these Russian parliamentarians, obviously having no idea how democracy works and thinking that he was democracy's hero, actually said yes to this idea. So, so now with his new dictator powers, um, he assembled his own team of economists, which were devoted fans of Milton Friedman, and who the Russian press actually ended up calling Chicago boys, going back to the old Chile days. And his plan, which he executed, was the lifting of price controls, so prices could go up, free trade policies, and the first phase of a rapid-fire privatization of the country's approximately 225,000 state-owned companies. Now, I understand that they had just come from communists, so everything was state-owned, but still, 225,000 companies now being available for purchase. This was amazing for, for Wall Street. Not so amazing for the employees in Russia. Um, and what happened to them was that millions of middle-class Russians lost half their life savings when their money lost its value. There were abrupt cut to subsidies, which meant that millions of workers weren't paid. The average Russian consumed 40% less in 1992 than they had consumed in 1991 due to the rising prices. And a third of the population immediately fell below the poverty line. So in 1993... The parliamentarians who looked at the results of Yeltsin's transformation of the country, they went to Yeltsin and said, you know those dictatorial powers we gave you? Um, give them back. And entirely predictably, he said no. What he did was declare a state of emergency, which gave him his powers back. Then the Constitutional Court ruled 9-3 to three that Yeltsin couldn't do that. But then... Yeltsin found out that he had the support of the West. Now, this is also important because the president at that time was not a Republican. All these clips that I played you today and we're, you know, I'm saying that this is a conservative thing. This was President Bill Clinton. So he said that Boris Yeltsin was, and this is a quote, genuinely committed to freedom and democracy, genuinely committed to reform. So as he is declaring himself dictator and we are supposed to be spreading democracy throughout the world, our democratic president is embracing this man. So with that confidence that the West was back behind him, Boris Yeltsin issued a decree announcing that the Constitution was now abolished and that parliament was dissolved. So it's the equivalent of Barack Obama walking into Congress and saying, hey guys, you don't exist anymore. This country is mine. That freaking happened. So naturally, Parliament tried to do something. Parliament, even though they're now officially dissolved, they did meet two days later and voted 636 to 2 to impeach for, uh, Boris Yeltsin. What did we do? Well, Clinton continued to back him, and Congress gave Yeltsin $2.5 billion in aid. So whose side were we on? Um, with that bundle of money and the confidence that he had the word beh world behind him, he dissolved all city and regional councils in the country. And on October 4th, 1993, Yeltsin ordered the army to storm the Russian parliament and set it on fire. So that's how Russia lost their democracy after hmm, about a week. Um, the day after Yeltsin burned down the parliament, they started writing economic decrees. And the one thing about these decrees that were different than some of the countries we've talked about is that when foreign, foreign multinationals were allowed into the country, they weren't allowed to directly own Russia's assets, which actually worked out really well for the Russian oligarchs because they were able to keep these prizes for themselves. So all the things that used to be public, their oil fields and their mines, all that stuff, it went directly into the hands of the oligarchs. Um, and so what happened to the people? In 1998, the economy crashed. More than 80% of Russian farms had gone bankrupt. 77,000 state factories had closed, and the elimination of the farms and the factories meant that there was an epidemic in unemployment. The number of people below the poverty line during communism, there were 2 million people in Russia below the poverty line. After Yeltsin, 
inflicted free market policies on his country, 74 million people ended up below the poverty line. And this amount of poverty created a doubling in the suicide rate. And then also violent crime increased almost fourfold. And that makes total sense because these are human beings we're talking about. And human beings, if they can't eat, they don't just roll over and die. They lie, cheat, they seal, they do what they have to do to get food for their families. And so just to show how much money went up to the very tippy tippy top, before all this went down, Russia had no millionaires at all. Not, and that's millionaires with an M. By 2003, the number of Russian billionaires with a B had risen to 17. Now, this is just a sample of some of the countries that this happened to. This is by no means an exhaustive list. I mean, this happened in South Korea and Colombia and Ecuador and Mexico, South Africa, Canada, Malaysia, Thailand, the list goes on. This happened all over the world, but I just don't have time. And I, I think you're probably getting a little bored with this now because the pattern, it's the same over and over and over again. But that brings me to the last place we're going to talk about today, and that is Iraq. Because unlike these other countries we've discussed where it is Bolivians inflicting this on Bolivians or Chileans doing this to Chileans, this was Americans doing this to Iraqi. Now, this is us. This is the United States directly imposing their will on another country. And I think it's really important for us to know what they were trying to do and what their motivations were. And you're going to notice the pattern because it comes a little bit creepy when you see what they did in Iraq and what they're trying to do at home. So when it comes to Iraq in 2001, 2002, um, we all should know by now that Saddam did not pose a threat to the United States. There were no mass weapons of mass destruction. But what he did pose a threat to was U.S. oil companies because he had signed contracts with a Russian oil giant and was in negotiation with France's total. And so that would have left our companies with nothing. Um, Iraq also had its economy anchored by its national oil company and 200 state-owned companies, which provided just about everything that Iraqis needed, their food, their materials for industry, cement, paper, cooking oil. I mean, you name it, they provided it from the state, which is the opposite, once again, of free market ideals. And so that meant that Arab countries, with Iraq being one of them, were the last remaining holdouts in this drive to build this global market based on Freeman's idea of unfettered, unregulated capitalism. And Iraq was, and we remember this, Iraq was supposed to spread democracy around the Middle East. Well, it wasn't democracy that we were talking about. It was capitalism. It was supposed to spread capitalism around the Middle East. That was the real goal. Now, between March 20th and May 2nd of 2003, the U.S. military went in there, and we all remember this, we bombed the hell out of them. We completely destroyed their infrastructure. And we know that wasn't necessary. We didn't need to do that to go and get Saddam. But it created a whole new market of reconstruction of Iraq that U.S. and multinational companies could go in and benefit from and profit from. So we created a blank slate and a blank slate in Iraq that we could rebuild. And the first thing that we did when we went into that country is we flung open the borders to unrestricted imports. There would be no tariffs, there would be no duties, there would be no inspections, and there would be no taxes. So all of these corporations can now sell their stuff to Iraqis and they would have to pay nothing at all to Iraq to do this. Now, um, what they wanted to do was to make Iraq the new frontier, like Russia was supposed to be. But they screwed up in Russia. Because remember, in Russia, they weren't allowed to go in and directly buy Russian assets. Instead, it was the Russian oligarchs that owned the assets. But multinationals and financiers and the big banks were able to come in and gamble in their casino. They were able to be shareholders and investors, but they couldn't own the assets. Well, that changed in Iraq. Paul Bremer, who was the guy who was put in charge of the Iraqi government, um, if you can really call it that, announced that immediately the 200 state-owned firms were going to be privatized. Bremer said, this is a quote, getting inefficient state enterprises into private hands is essential for Iraq's economic recovery. And um, he wrote some new economic laws for the country. First, Iraq's corporate tax rate would be lowered from the 45% that it was under Saddam to a flat 15% rate. So the, that's the uh, flat tax. 
foreign companies would be allowed 100% ownership of Iraqi assets, so that's how they took care of the Russian problem. Investors would be allowed to take 100% of the profits overseas. They wouldn't be required to reinvest any money at all into Iraq, and they would not be taxed one penny. Investors would be allowed to sign leases for their new assets for 40 years, and would, those leases would be eligible for renewal, which would mean that any future government that takes over Iraq would be stuck with the contracts that were designed by the occupiers. The only thing that they didn't go and privatize right off the bat was the oil, and that's because there was a giant spotlight on the oil company and that the Iraqis had informed us that if we go and we and we take the oil right away that there was going to be a problem with the population. So instead, what we did is we took $20 billion from the National Oil Company, and Bremer allowed his government to spend it however it pleased. Now, a disgusting side note to this, $8.8 billion of that $20 billion we took from the oil company just straight up disappeared. We have absolutely no idea what happened to it. It's what's known as, the, as Iraq's missing billions. $8.8 billion, gone. And so within a few months of the invasion, um, the corporations were already making plans for coming in and um, doing business in Iraq once we got things settled. McDonald's was going to open in downtown Baghdad. Funding was almost in place for a Starwood luxury hotel. General Motors was planning to build an auto plant. And HSBC, which is an international bank headquartered in London, since, of course, London helped us out with this, um, they were awarded the contract to open branches all over Iraq, so they were basically going to be the banking masters of that country. But um, before that could happen, the country had to get up and running, and so we privatized that task out to American companies. Bearing Point designed and managed the economy. Um, private security firms like Blackwater, they were brought in to train Iraq's new army and police, Creative Associates, which is a management and education firm in Washington, D.C., was given $100 million to write a whole new curriculum for Iraq. So that whole history that they had been learning, we were going to wipe that out and replace it. And this was something that ended up not actually happening because the Iraqs just weren't having it. But um, that was privatized. And then the Green Zone. The Green Zone is a Halliburton-run city-state. It is 100% run by that company, with them being in charge of everything from road maintenance to pest control. They even had movie and disco nights. It was a private city, one of the first of its kind. But do you know who didn't get a piece of this action? Well, that would be Iraq. Iraq had 17 state-owned cement factories that could have really helped out in the reconstruction of their bombed-out country, but they received nothing. Not one contract, no generators, no help at all. Instead, um, the American companies preferred to import their cement, just like their workforce from overseas, at up to 10 times the price. And keep in mind, who is paying that price? Oh, that would be us. So every time you think about this debt that we're in, remember this, okay? And while American companies at a highly inflated rate were reconstructing Iraq, Iraqis had no role in the plan at all. In fact, one of Brimmer's rules, or one of his laws, specifically prohibited Iraq's central bank from offering financing to state-owned enterprises. So even if they wanted to do something on their own and stand up independently and fix their country, it wasn't allowed. It was against the law. And it wasn't just people in the factories that lost their jobs when Bremer came in. Bremer's first major act as head of the government was to fire approximately half a million people, um, all of them state workers. Most of them were soldiers, but there were also doctors, nurses, teachers, engineers, people with regular jobs that were thrown out merely because they were working for the state and not for a private company. And I think this is very illustrative of the, the mindset in Washington, which is that the only jobs that matter are private jobs. Um, here's some more sign sound bites from the 112th Congress, and every single one of these people was re-elected back to the House of Representatives. This is Kevin Brady of Texas, Stephen Fincher of Tennessee, Tim Wahlberg of Michigan, Corey Gardner of Colorado, and Martha Roby of Alabama. Real growth in the economy, the foundation for creating jobs along Main Street, for hardworking Americans, it comes from the private sector and not from government. We have to remind ourselves in this body that jobs are not created in the halls of Congress. They're created in the private sector. The private sector, not government, is and will always remain the real job creator for our country. Real job creation comes from the private sector, from small businesses and private employers. 
We have solutions where we can change things and the private sector can thrive, but that is going to mean getting the government out of the way. And that's what this was. This was getting Saddam's government out of the way. That's what they told us it was. But it was really just getting state workers out of the way so that they could put private people in there. Because private people, private jobs equal profit. It's a way to funnel money out of public funding and put it into private hands. So, so in Iraq, they felt that it was okay to get rid of half a million people that had incredibly important jobs to society. I mean, these were doctors, nurses, teachers, engineers, even though they were important to society, they didn't matter to Paul Bremer and the neoconservatives that were running the show because they worked for the state. That's all that they saw was who they worked for. And the fact that you couldn't, pri you couldn't, pull profits from their work. Now, originally, the Bush administration was planning to have elections. I don't know if they were planning to rig them or not, because they never actually happened. They realized quite quickly that if the Iraqis were allowed to elect their own leaders, those leaders would probably not be on board with these economic policies that were the motivation behind the war. And so in order to keep their economic agenda, the elections had to go. Um, Paul Bremer decided that he would pick the members of the Iraqi governing council um, when local elections started spontaneously happening all over the country, which our sol soldiers were helping with. I mean, you have to remember, this first group of guys, they were told that they were going to Iraq to give people democracy. So when the locals said, can you help us build ballot boxes? Our boys said, hell yeah, you know, because that's what they believed they were there for. But Bremer told everyone in the country that all local elections need to stop immediately. And in November of 2003, he canceled the, na the national elections. So far from supporting democracy in the Middle East, it became quite clear to the Iraqis by the, the end of August 2003 that democracy was not what they were getting from the United States. And, um, you know, in most wars... The autocracies that happen when there's torture and there's murder, that stuff usually happens in the beginning. It usually happens during the fog of war, and that's not what happened in Iraq. Um, the Iraqis were actually somewhat cool with us until we fired their middle class, which created a lot of angry people, when we opened their borders to unrestricted imports and made it impossible for their companies to compete. That's what pissed off their business class. And when we canceled their elections, that's when we angered everybody else. And so in August 2003, after Bremer's long summer of lawmaking and election canceling, that's when the violence began. And in September, middle September 2003, um, Lieutenant General Ricardo Sanchez, which is a name all of us should know, he was the top commander in Iraq, and he authorized a wide range of new interrogation procedures based on the Guantanamo mo model. And that's how we brought torture to Iraq. So when you think about Pinochet, when you think about General Suharto, when you think about all of the torturers from around the world, we became one of them when we tried to push through the same exact economic policies that they did. So after the torture and the subduing of the Iraqi population, which actually never really worked because the Iraqis are a more strong-willed people than the Bush administration ever gave them credit for. Um, it became time in 2006 for us to privatize the oil. Bush, you remember the Iraq study group? Well, the Iraq study group they suggested, quote, for the U.S. to assist Iraqi leaders to reorganize the national oil industry as a commercial enterprise and to, quote, encourage investment in Iraq's oil sector by the international community and by international energy companies. So 2006, three years later, despite the violence, despite the, the fact that Iraq's infrastructure was still not built, people still only had a couple hours a day of electricity, despite all of that, it was go time. It was oil time. And the Bush administration got right to work. They drafted a new oil law for Iraq. And when it came out in February of 2007, it was even worse than people thought it was going to be. 
It allowed oil companies to sign 30-year contracts in which they could keep most of Iraq's oil profits. And remember, this was a country where most of their money came from their oil. So we were taking just about everything they had. Um, it placed no limits on the amounts of profits that foreign countries could take from the country. So now, instead of the oil coming out of the ground and going into Iraq's roads and bridges and education and all of those things that taxes provide for, all of that money could just go into the pockets of whoever um, is at the top of the multinational corporations that, that sign these contracts. It made no requirements on foreign investors to partner with Iraqi com companies or hire Iraqis to work in the oil fields. So if ExxonMobil wants to ship in people from Texas to actually do the work, that was going to be allowed and the, oils, the Iraqis would just have to watch. It also excluded Iraq's elected parliamentarians from having any say in the terms for future oil contracts. So this law was it and it was going to stay that way forever. Um, it also created the Federal Oil and Gowns Council, which would be a panel of oil experts from inside and outside Iraq. And it would have ultimate decision-making power on all oil matters, with the full authority to decide which contracts Iraq did or did not sign. So outsiders could come into Iraq and decide what would happen with the wealth underneath their sand. Um, it was incredibly unfair, and it was a promise of poverty in a country where 95% of their government revenues was coming from oil. And the people that did this to Iraq, these people are our people. This was our president, George W. Bush, that did this to Iraq. Back in the Russian days, it was President Clinton that was supporting these behaviors in, in Russia. It was... Milton Friedman, Milton Friedman himself was an American. So if you haven't been making connections between the things, the patterns that we've seen in these other countries and the things that have happened to us here, let me connect some of those dots for you right now. Um, first, with the military, for Bremer's staff um, in his, his Iraqi government, he had 1,500 people on his staff to govern Iraq, which has 25 million people in the country. By contrast, Bremer had 1,500. Halliburton had 50,000 people in Iraq to do its business. And Bremer's staff were paid government salaries. Halliburton's staff were paid hundreds of thousand dollars each. They would get like $100,000, $200,000 to do menial tasks because they were private. And all of that, no matter whether you were on Bremer's staff or you were on Halliburton's staff, that was all coming from our tax money. Um, in fact, Bremer's staff was so understaffed that they couldn't even perform their oversight functions to the other contractors. They contracted out the oversight of contractors to Parsons for $30 million. Um, and then there was the military itself. Donald Rumsfeld wanted that as small as possible because the goal was to privatize as much as he could. So even though the generals asked him for 500,000 troops, he only gave them less than 200,000. So that was less than half of what the army asked for, the army and the, the Marines asked for. And then in the name of freeing up soldiers for combat, because there were so few of them, Halliburton took on dozens of roles that the Army traditionally did, like maintaining their vehicles and their, their radios and their equipment. And of course, once again, our troops were paid thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a year, normal middle-class salaries, and every one of these private contractors was making way, 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 way more than them. All of them paid with taxpayer dollars. Um, private security companies. They didn't hire Americans to go and do this, these jobs. They hired rev veterans from wars in Colombia, South Africa, Nepal. Um, in fact, Blackwater and a couple other firms hired more than 700 Chilean troops, which were trained under Pinochet himself. And then this is kind of scary. In 2004, during a battle with Moqtada al-Sadr, Blackwater actually assumed command over our guys after our over our active duty U.S. Marines in a battle there. So we're now at the point that these private contractors are taking over our army and that is so unacceptable. Um, so, and then what happened with these contractors? These contractors were freed of all regulations. In fact, there were laws written, written for the contractors giving them immunity from criminal prosecutions. And then they also had these contracts that guaranteed that the US taxpayers, us, would pay any costs that these companies incurred plus a guaranteed profit. And the profits were determined as a proportion of costs. So the more their costs went up, the more their profits went up. So what did they do? They scammed us. In fact, in the first episode, I told you something about the burn pit registry because 
there were soldiers that were in Iraq, soldiers, contractors, whoever, that were in Iraq that had health effects because of these burned pits. You know what a burn pit is? A burn pit is when they were taking their equipment that was functioning just fine, stuck it in a pile, and set it on fire so that they would have to order more. And that would make their costs go up, which would make their profits go up. That's what a burn pit is. And those things were happening all over the country to the point that we need to have a registry because it was so common that it made a lot of our guys sick. How gross is that? And our privatized media, they don't tell us any of these things. You know, there was a time 40 years ago maybe that our media actually did their job and the news was not allowed to be done for a profit. There was, there was an amazing movie. It's totally on Netflix. It's called Network. That was made in the 1970s when it was, it was a satire. It was unthinkable that they would allow the news to be done for profit. And that's exactly what's happened. So that's how you end up with something like Fox News that lies. I mean, they, they do. They just lie all day long. And they're completely partisan. They are 100% a part of the Republican Party. They give out the marching orders. You have that in a privatized corporate media. You also have MSNBC that saw the profitability of picking a side, so they just went to the other side. But neither one of them can talk about this stuff because, I mean, this $6 billion election, where did that $6 billion go? It went to TV ads. It went to Fox News. It went to MSNBC. It went to your local NBC affiliate. It went to your local Fox affiliate. It went to the radio stations, which have all been completely consolidated. Why is it that Rush Limbaugh and Bill O'Reilly and Sean Hannity and Ryan Seacrest and all these people can be heard in every single city in this country? There used to be local ownership of radio stations. They've all been gobbled up by a couple of giant companies that find it much cheaper to produce one show, pay that one guy a lot of money, and put it all over the country. So that's what happens when you privatize your media. And that's why we don't know what's happening to us. Our privatized health care, now that's a giant racket. And the health care is one of the reasons that I am not stoked about Barack Obama. Yes, I do think that Obamacare, as it's known, has some good things for us. Pre-existing conditions and being able to deny people because they have them, it, it doesn't get much more evil than that. So it's good that those went away. But Oga Obamacare is a health care overhaul, quote unquote, that still allows the private companies to control our health care. That still means that we have to go to them in order to see our doctor. It's still this giant middleman where they're allowed to take money that's supposed to go towards our health and instead goes, instead goes towards some profits. There's certain things that you should not be able to profit from in a society and sick people is probably one of them. We have privatized schools that teach children that Jesus was the founder of the United States and are actually, actually able to get away with it. That is what charter schools are. Charter schools are profit. So instead of your tax money going to public schools that are good for everybody, they go into charter schools. The owners of the schools take some of the money and can put it in your pocket and the rest of it goes towards educating your children. It also allows them to control what the curriculum is. So if they want to teach Jesus in those schools, they absolutely can. I know this because I went to one of them. We also have privatized electricity companies that didn't prepare for Hurricane S Sandy. And now Chris Kirstie is calling for an investigation as to why over 100,000 people are still out of power in New Jersey. And I know this is true because I follow a girl on Twitter who still doesn't have power. It's been almost two weeks now. Um, we have privatized retirement, 401k. And 401k, this one makes me particularly crazy because this is what, when they said, okay, no more pensions, which guarantees you a certain amount of money every month as your income. Pensions is the reason that my grandparents are still living comfortably. When they said that 401ks is a better way to earn your retirement, they basically got all of us involved in their casino. They make us all think that we have a big stake in it. But it's also incredibly volatile because your retirement can pretty much disappear when the market has a bad day. Do you remember September 2008? That was not an isolated incident. And all the things that caused the, the bubbles that burst that day and made your retirement savings go away, all of that stuff has not been fixed. There have been no more rules put in place. The Republicans are very proud of the fact that they put no new regulations in for the last two years. 
So if it feels like things are getting harder for the middle class, for the most of us in this country, it's because they are. This privatized system is completely sucking us dry. Our taxes are not going to our education anymore. They're not going to our health care. They're not going to our roads. They're not. Our tax dollars are not going things to things that benefit us. It's going to the military. 20%, 20% of our taxes go to the military. There is an undisclosed amount that goes to the CIA, but every time you hear about the CIA doing something, whether whether it's with drones or with these missions, they have a secret budget that we're not allowed to know about, but that we pay for. Same with the NSA. We pay for these contractors. So instead of paying people in our military $40,000 and who are fully accountable and have to obey the laws of the United States, we're paying contractors three times that to do the same thing that our military used to do. So the people that are actually working for the contractors, they're profitizing on this. I mean, they're war profiteers too because they could be joining the military, but they're not. They're joining these contractors. And then these contractors, they get to take the, the heads of these companies, they get to take some of that money and put it in their pockets. That's our money. And when it comes to how we're paid, our wages are going down. Earlier this year, they were freezing the pay of federal workers. And this is Dennis Ross of Florida explaining his reasoning on why the federal workers' pay needed to come down. Yet current federal salaries and benefits are not in line with the marketplace when compared to private workforce. Federal civil, civilian work, workers receive generous benefits, pay, and job security. In fact, there is a four times greater chance of losing your job in the private sector than there is with the federal workforce. So instead of saying that the private sector should have to pay people the good wages that people get in the federal government, the people that we have voted to represent us in the House of Representatives are fighting to bring wages down to the crappy level established by the market. How does that help you, Florida? How does that help any of you? And here's why this happens. These are not evil people. Dennis Ross is not a bad person. None of these people who you've heard clips from, I believe, are bad people. They are business people. What we've done is we've elected our bosses to go into the body, the government, that protects us from our bosses. So let's say you're working in a company and they're forcing you to work 16-hour days. Where are you going to go in order to get that situation corrected. Well, you have to go to the government. That's all there is. The government is the one who's supposed to protect you from being taken advantage of. And if you elect your boss to represent you, you got nowhere to go. And these people, they, they come into government on behalf of the private sector, and they genuinely don't see the difference between what's good for the private sector, what's good for the CEOs, and what's good for society. They genuinely think that's the same thing. This is one of the rising stars of the Republican Party, Rob Woodall. You've heard him a couple times today of Georgia. Um, Jeff, Jeff Sessions of Texas, who is a very well-respected congressman. I actually saw him all over the place on election night. And the Speaker of the House, John Boehner. 435 of us. You know, Mr. Speaker, this, this freshman class is, is full of a bunch of CEOs from the, from the private sector, folks who ran for Congress because they were worried about the direction of this country, and they said, dadgummit, uh, I've got to step up, I've got to run, I've got to be a part of the solution. People in Washington, D.C., who probably wouldn't recognize the free enterprise system if they saw it, put rules and regulations on people. They don't understand the business, they don't understand how they operate, and they sure as heck don't understand why it's important to have a free enterprise system, one which is nimble and prepared and ready for competition. I spent 16 years without missing a day of work in the private sector prior to coming to Congress. You know, I never thought uh, my wildest dreams I'd ever run for public office, uh, ever seek uh, to come here to Congress. Uh, but as a small businessman, I was concerned about the ever-growing size of the federal government, the ever-growing reach of the federal government, I saw it in my own business, I saw it with my suppliers, I saw it with my customers. And out of that frustration, I came here. Because I thought government was too big, spent too much, uh, and was far intrusive, far too intrusive uh, into uh, our economy and frankly our society. See, they're not 
evil. This isn't a good or evil thing. This is business people coming into Congress to take care of other business people. It's as natural as anything to want to take care of the financial interests of people that are just like you. The thing is that what works for them doesn't work for a lot of us. The majority of us work for paychecks. We bring home paychecks. We have bosses. We don't own companies. And those of us who do own companies own small companies. I own a small company. I am starting a new business with this podcast that makes absolutely nothing right now. And none of these policies that are supposed to be for small business are good for me. What's good for Viacom, Viacom is my competition and Viacom has so much more money than I do. So what's good for them is not good for me. So I don't want my representative to be the CEO of Viacom. And until we figure that out, until we look at our representative and say, do they represent me or do they represent companies? Until that becomes the dividing line, we're going to continue to be confused as to why we feel like we're getting poorer and neither of the parties represent us because the top two parties, they don't. They represent companies. They're working with companies. And the biggest difference between the two parties is the Republican Party seems to really believe in the free market fundamentals. And the Democratic Party is trying to walk the line. They want to do this free market stuff, but they want to make it regulated. And they don't seem to understand that if you're a free market fundamentalist, if you believe in a free market, it can't have any regulation. So they need to think of a new system. And that's why the Democrats just seem so ineffective. It's because they are. They don't know what they believe. It's just like Barack Obama himself. He's trying to be everybody's friend. Well, you can't be. You're either part of the free market crowd or you're not. And at least with libertarians, they know that they're a free market crowd. What's cool about libertarians is at least socially, they want to legalize gay marriage and weed. And so us younger people, we like that part of the libertarians. And we don't get the economic part. As much as we look at the social issues, we need to start focusing on the economic ones. And we need to start look, looking what's in these bills. And that's what I'm here for. So... I apologize for running so far over today. This isn't going to be routine. Usually this show is an hour, but this stuff was important and I wanted to explain it once and for all. If you want more details on this, I got the vast majority of my facts today from one of the most influential books in my life. It's called The Shock Doctrine. It was written by Naomi Klein. I I will recommend books to you from time to time, but this particular one is essential. If you want to understand the things that I just told you and get more details, that is the book you need to read, and it's available in the show notes. It pretty much is the show notes for this week, is um, a link to buy that book. And if you buy it through my website, I do get a couple of pennies, and considering I'm doing this full time and I don't make anything, it would be greatly appreciated. Um, what would be more appreciated, it would be if you go to Congressional Dish on iTunes, you press the subscribe button. It's free. This is completely free. And if you maybe give me a rating, um, any five-star ratings or reviews that you give me will help me move up in the iTunes charts so that hopefully I'm not just sitting here talking to myself anymore. And um, you can always also listen to the... Um, the podcast on my website itself, it's congressionaldish.com. That's where I go and put any notes that I have. So so Congress comes back next week. Their first day back to work is Tuesday, November 16th. So I will be back with a typical show. This is not a typical one, but one that tells you what's in the bills next weekend. Um, you can expect these episodes, the new episodes, to be published by Sunday morning. If I can finish them earlier, I will put them out earlier, but Sunday morning is my absolute deadline so that you can listen to this before the Sunday shows. And um, thank you for listening, and I will talk to you next week.